Uh, Dr. Surrender, Mera, uh, Professor Nielsen, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it is really wonderful and uh, also to open this year's Korean Temple Lecture Series. Whenever you hear, uh, or almost always when you hear a speech about climate change or when you start reading a book about climate change, there seems to be this almost mandatory first chapter about just how terrible our future may look like if we do not take climate action as quickly as possible. And while I agree with that assessment in general and with that sentiment, I do want to spare you that first chapter today. The fact that you are here or that you are listening to and watching our live stream means that you do know about the urgency of the situation. And I assume also that you do know for yourself where to find that most important body of internationally highly peer-reviewed climate science called the IPCC uh, reports. The IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, publishes its major reports only every six to seven years. And just this month, in about three weeks from now, we expect the IPCC's long-expected report on the impacts of climate change. And then in March, the next working group report on possible mitigation measures for climate change. And then finally, in September, that big, long-expected summary report. Now, again, this happens only every six to seven years. And so 2022 is a big year in climate science and hence should also be a big year in climate journalism. Add to this, just from a newsroom's planning perspective, that we'll also have the U.S. midterm elections in November. The U.S. is not only the world's second largest emitter of greenhouse gases per year in total tonnage after China, it also features many prominent politicians that are still in outright denial of climate science and whose views, especially during these uh, campaign cycles, keep getting amplified into the global news sphere through the sheer weight uh, of, of US-based news organizations and their reach and influence. Having said that, the US also spends more on research and development than any other country on the planet. And so these elections, from many angles, are very, very consequential for climate change. And the third of the foreseeable globally relevant climate news events this year is the UN Climate Summit, the COP27 itself, which unfortunately sh starts just one day before the US elections take place and then will have to compete, especially in the US, for the media's attention. So you can see even without the foreseeable extreme weather events of this coming year, climate change is certain to play a prominent role in the public sphere and at least hopefully also in the sphere of journalism. And that is the topic of my lecture today. The news media's role and current challenges in covering climate change adequately. I'm speaking to you today, obviously uh, not as an academic, but as a media manager with a long international career in journalism and in managing newsrooms, and then one of the world's largest publishing companies. And my research during this last year was driven by the search for practical solutions to today's challenges in newsrooms. During this year, I have also spent time with many newsrooms for closed door uh, workshops. And typically what I've observed there is a tendency uh, of journalists that is also true for myself, which is that journalists tend to think, and I say this jokingly, that the solution to every problem that has ever existed is more journalism. And so many of these newsroom managers that invited me asked me, so tell us, Wolfgang, uh, which formats should we develop? Which formats work? What works at competitors? What content should we produce? And of course, these are valid questions, but they are also skipping a more fundamental issue, which is that there is a growing number of news organizations that have set up climate desks, that have increased the amount of journalism, of content on the climate crisis. And now a year or two years in are realizing that these new teams did not have the transformative effect on the rest of their newsrooms or the success with their audiences that they had hoped for. This is why the emphasis of my lecture today is not on content types and formats, but on the many systemic issues and levers, really, that newsroom managers should be aware of when assessing and then developing how their newsroom covers uh, climate change. My lecture has three chapters. First, I will establish some needed context. In chapter two, I will then become very operational and go into the details um, of, of newsroom culture, newsroom ethics, and operational questions. 
And then in a short closing chapter, I will attempt to give a few recommendations on the sequencing of certain steps to take for newsrooms. I guess that by now, some of the journalists uh, watching and here in the room will have noticed that thus far I've only used the word climate change and not, for instance, climate crisis, as my dear colleagues at The Guardian, our former colleagues, are suggesting in their style guide for many good reasons. The word crisis describes a temporary phenomenon with a beginning and an end. But if we magically stopped all greenhouse gas emissions at midnight tonight, no person alive, not even today's children, would see the end of the climate challenges we have already created with the emissions done until today, which is why crisis isn't really a precise term. But as so often in journalism, a dilemma of terminology like this one is best solved through what is called lexical variation by alternating between any of the terms above and others, including global warming, global heating, global weirding, the climate situation, the climate emergency, or simply the big climate question to all of us. My point is that this change is so vast, so unprecedented as a phenomenon uh, at, at, at its scale and its speed, that we struggle even with what to call it. A year ago, when I finally mustered the courage to pause my career as a manager to educate myself about climate change, I somehow thought back then, I still thought of climate change as an issue, uh, as, a, as, a, as a topic, but not as this broad, all-encompassing, systemic challenge that would truly change everything. And in the most abstract terms, I did not understand that we are looking really at two simultaneous systemic challenges. On one hand, we have the twin challenge of climate change and a rapid decline in biodiversity. On the other hand, we have the challenge of needing to shift our global energy regime of the last roughly 150 years from fossil fuels to a mix of renewables as quickly as any possible. And I did not see the consequence of a shift, that the consequence of a shift in energy regimes alone would be so vast and lead to all kinds of social, economic and also geopolitical tensions, tremors or outright conflicts, even if there were no ecological crises to accompany it. So in hindsight, I am genuinely intrigued by the degree to which I either avoided or was simply unable to comprehend the systemic nature of these two shifts. That there is no region, no industry, no profession that isn't already or will not be challenged by climate change. So, sure, it would be easy to point fingers at me and to ridicule me because the information was always there, never more than one click away. It would also be easy to point fingers at journalists or entire news organizations who are now increasingly being accused of just not getting it. That majority of news organizations who are in full acknowledgement of peer-reviewed climate science when you ask them, but who still do not give climate change the prominent treatment across all their desks that is needed now. I've also seen the reverse. I have seen journalists pointing fingers at their audiences when they did not engage with their climate journalism as much as these journalists thought they should have. And on a personal note, it would also be easy for me to be at least mildly annoyed by my friends and colleagues who often refer to climate change as Wolfgang's topic, or worse, as Wolfgang's passion, which it isn't actually, but I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this being the necessity of our time. So over the course of my fellowship with the Reuters Institute, I became very interested in the nature of this human denial and of human biases in our perception of the world around us and what role these may play in newsrooms. The science publisher Nature Springer and a UN organization under the leadership of Jeffrey Sachs then asked me to co-chair an international panel of scientists to study how to best communicate climate science and COVID science in the context of rampant misinformation and how to factor in obstacles such as our human biases. And for starters, this is just a map of 188 known human biases, with the status quo bias being a very important factor in disregarding the systemic upheaval that comes with climate change. 
And what this work has helped me appreciate is how denial and avoidance are subtle mental and emotional constructs and coping mechanisms that newsroom managers need to be aware of when it comes to climate change. Typically, denial cannot be undone or overcome in one go with one big tell-all fact-heavy documentary or in the case of newsrooms with one big tell-all heroic memo from the chief editor to all staff. Denial has many, many layers. Denial needs to be addressed with precision, with empathy and with a degree of patience. Two questions drove me then in my studies this last year. First, how was it possible that despite my own numerous climate-related initiatives over the past 15 years, from launching global carbon audits at Condé Nast to launching the world's first climate contents indication network back together with Alan Raspertier at The Guardian, that I still managed to somehow close my eyes to the immediacy of this crisis and that I treated it as a future problem. Second, why is it that not all, but many of the world's political, business and religious leaders, as well as the world's young people, are sounding so much more concerned about climate change than most newsroom leaders do that I speak with and spoke with. To illustrate this, an international landmark study by researchers from seven universities and colleges have interviewed more than 10,000 young people in 10 countries last year on their feelings about climate change and about their government's response to climate change. Here's a visualization of the results by Nature magazine. When asked, how worried are you about climate change? 59% said they were either very worried or extremely worried. Imagine, imagine you yourself being one of those 18 to 24 year olds and then go back in your mind to the news site or the news program that you are using every day. Would you, as an 18 to 24 year old, with all that lifetime ahead of you, would you think that your news organization was giving climate change the attention it should? A related sentiment of despair or disenfranchisement of younger people also came through in the European Moments study by Professor Timothy Garton Ash, who is uh, here with us today, and by his team. And in this study, in this representative study, 53% of young Europeans across 27 EU nations and the UK between the ages of 16 and 29, agree or somewhat agree with the idea that authoritarian states are better equipped than democracies to tackle the climate crisis. And this is a finding that should worry any news organization that defines its role as informing a democratic public sphere. And as for the world's leaders, there are really many stark quotes that stand out. Take UN General Secretary uh, Antonio Gutierrez, quote, we are on the verge of the abyss. For the leader of a highly consensus-driven intergovernmental organization, that is a radical quote. President Biden frequently says climate change is now the number one issue facing humanity, or Pope Francis, as the spiritual leader of 1.3 billion Catholics, regularly makes very stark comments and asks for radical changes. And the probably best summary uh, of sentiment amongst the world's largest corporations, in parallel to a lot of greenwashing coming from many of them, is this newest risk register of the World Economic Forum, which for the first time lists lack of climate action failure as their number one risk. And if you take a look at this slide, you will see that the good old macroeconomic risks that you would have seen on these rankings in the past uh, the first one shows up, I think, in rank nine, the risk of debt crises. And so you have to wonder, most especially though in the light of the IPCC's findings, what more will it take for the news media to realize that in the next few years, climate change is likely to require a degree of upskilling, retraining, rehiring, and also of rethinking journalism itself that is at least equal to the digital shift of the last two decades in the news industry. So based on these initial questions, I spoke with news organizations around the world 
climate reporters, science reporters, but also newsroom managers, uh, and ask them questions such as, is your organization planning to expand its coverage of climate change? Uh, which newsroom structure uh, have you chosen for that? Do you think your team is sufficiently trained for that? Do you have a good understanding of what your audience would like to see, hear, or read? Um, have you offered trainings to your staff? How difficult is it to get access to relevant scientists? Uh, are you or is your line manager ever worried about you being perceived as an activist and not as a journalist when you cover climate change? And crucially, I always ask that simple question, and how are you doing today? That often was the question that revealed the most useful additional information. After having these conversations for several months, uh, and taking notes, your, your pattern recognition kicks in and you begin to form hypotheses of what are these topics that keep getting mentioned across cultures, political regimes and across countries, but also what, my, what, what some of the blind spots may be of the people you are interviewing. And as an example of a potential blind spot, not a single one of my interview partners mentioned or at least raised the question whether their audience has the necessary basic knowledge to even make sense of the climate journalism they are providing them with. Think about it, how often do you see news media refer to the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree goal, or the IPCC? And this can become even more of an issue when US news media speak of the 1.5 degree goal in a country that reports weather updates and measures temperatures in Fahrenheit. So let's begin our chapter two tonight and look at these systemic issues I think I was able to identify that apply to a large number of news organizations. And I've grouped them into operational, cultural, and ethical issues. Operational issues usually require management attention and or financial investments to be overcome, but they can be overcome. Cultural issues are much harder to overcome or to transform, and some of them cannot be overcome but it is still very useful for newsroom managers to be aware of them, a bit like you would factor in a compass deviation when you are on a hike. Ethical issues can be overcome comparatively quickly and do not necessarily require financial investment, but they do require newsroom leaders, typically the chief editor, to make normative decisions that can be controversial and may require courage. Now the good news, most of the issues identified are operational issues. First and foremost, basic climate literacy in the newsroom. It is extremely difficult for climate reporters to succeed in a news organization, let alone for an entire newsroom to integrate climate dimensions across all desks, if that newsroom staff has no basic knowledge of the science of climate change. In broad terms, climate literacy, I think, should include basic knowledge of the fragile natural greenhouse effect. Start with the science, not politics. Basic climate literacy for journalists also means to know where you can look up reliable, peer-reviewed information about climate change. It should also include knowing the dramatic difference between the effects of global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 2 degrees, let alone to 2.4 degrees, which is the mid-range of what we're currently headed to. And lastly, Journalists should know where to look up reliable figures on greenhouse gas emissions by country or also by sector and how they stack up against our remaining emission budget by country where that is available or at least globally. Because without these two goalposts, the, the amount of emissions and the remaining budget of emissions that are possible to not overshoot 1.5 or 2, so many stories about promising new technologies, interesting policy proposals, uh, or reduction commitments are really missing the context that is necessary for a reader to make sense and to understand whether this story is important or not. So these are the basics. And when you compare these climate literacy basics with the knowledge that we expect from general news uh, journalists about how their country's election systems work, or um, what the rules are of their country's most popular sports, I think uh, these few items on climate change are not too much to ask or to train for. In fact, these can be taught fairly quickly within a matter of one or two days. The related operational issue on the other side, of course, is your audience's 
climate literacy. Because for journalism to reach its full potential or to just do its work, its audience needs to have a basic understanding of the concepts and terms that are needed to follow a story. And as a starting point, I think news organizations should at least survey their audiences about their current knowledge of climate change. A less intrusive, but also statistically less indicative approach is to offer quizzes on climate change as a way of gathering and of conveying basic knowledge. Examples here are the climate quizzes by the Financial Times, by the Washington Post, or in a localized version by Boston's public radio station WBUR. The Financial Times has this taken further with a really brilliant interactive where you can first guess and then draw on screen your own assumed temperature or emissions growth curves and then see afterwards whether you guessed them right. Other news organizations such as here Bloomberg and Sky News are experimenting with embedding climate data dashboards into their content. But with the climate crisis being much more complex than COVID-19, for which you often see great editorial dashboards with key metrics, it does remain difficult to pick a small enough set of climate metrics an audience could become familiar with. An operational issue is also that news organizations tend to know very little about their audience's more general attitudes towards climate change, meaning how concerned they are. A true pioneer in this research is a survey called Global Warming Six Americas by Yale University and George Mason University. And they are and have been mapping the US population along categories from those being outright dismissive of global warming being an issue to those who are highly alarmed by it. Other countries have then run their own segmentation studies, each with different methodologies. This is an overview that has been uh, assembled by Professor David Holmes at Australia's Monash University, who has been wonderfully supportive of my work this last year. And the operational value of such national segmentations for a newsroom materializes then when you can measure which one of these segments in your country's general population are even present amongst your own news organization's audience. So this chart here again by Professor Holmes uh, shows the audience composition of Australia's main news organizations matched against the five Australian general population segments of being alarmed, concerned, uncertain, doubtful, or dismissive regarding climate change. And so once you know that more than half of your audience is either concerned or even alarmed, you may want to shift your resource and your newsroom's attention away from proving the basic climate science over to spending much more time and scrutinizing various and often competing measures for mitigation and adaptation to climate change. A currently very prominent discussion in many newsrooms I'm in touch with is which organizational structure they should pick to expand their coverage of climate change. And the three typical approaches are you expand your existing science desk that typically has been covering climate change for the last decades, uh, give them more budget, more staff, or you set up a parallel climate desk with a slightly different configuration, also with policy people, for instance, or psychologists if it's a large news organization. Third approach, especially important for that majority of small news organizations that often do not have a science editor to begin with, is to set up a, a virtual hub of interested staff from all verticals, and then to make sure that they meet, for instance, once a week to compare all their, their topics that they have planned and to see which ones of those really have missing climate dimensions or angles to them and then to help them in adding them. There is no one right structure. All of them greatly depend on the personal engagement of a newsroom's leadership team and chief editor as they all require a greater degree of uh, collaboration. I have spoken, to my surprise, with a few climate journalists, not many, but a few, who told me that they were considering leaving climate journalism again, as they felt worn down or left alone by their newsrooms in defending themselves against climate trolls. And for newsroom managers and social media editors, it is important to not view all trolling across all topics and issues as just one and the same phenomenon. To discredit specifically climate journalism is key part 
of orchestrated and by now well-documented climate disinformation campaigns that oftentimes are very well funded. So it can, it can last weeks that a journalist gets harassed and slowly uh, taken down for their reporting. A good starting point for editors is to look up the research on this topic by Professor Stefan Lewandowski at the University of Bristol, as well as the book The New Climate Wars by Professor Michael Mann at Pennsylvania State University. There is also this useful study here, jointly conducted by researchers at uh, George Mason, Monash, Trinity uh, College in Dublin and Exeter, where they created an entire taxonomy of typical claims by climate science denialists and other types of contrarians, uh, such as the ice is not melting or renewable energy can't work. And such a map is at least a helpful tool for audience and social media editors just for their pattern recognition. Performance metrics to measure the success of your journalism. This is a theme that came up frequently, not only in the interviews I conducted, but also in some of the workshops I've been invited to. One climate journalist summed it up best for me and said, I quote, I have the full support now from my chief editor. I've been given a budget increase. My problem now is the foreign editor who doesn't, doesn't give me access to our foreign bureaus when I need them because supposedly my stories are not as important as they are breaking news stories. And my other and much bigger problem are the news desk editors who do not give my story a prime time slot or never quite promote it on social media at the right time of day because they think it will not perform well. And this latter issue, of course, raises questions about the metrics by which especially digital news organizations typically uh, measure the success of their content. Page views, click-through rates, session time, scroll depth, share rates, all those tell us quite a lot, but they're not the same as the so-called impact metrics or the now what metrics, which are much more expensive to measure at a decent scale. Impact metrics look at what happened after you have read a text. Did you buy a book? about the topic? Did you mention it at work, in your family? Has it made you think about your consumer behaviors or the, your voting preferences, things like that? With the current digital content performance metrics alone, climate journalism is really at risk of not getting sufficient placement or promotion by the news desk. And I think in the most extreme, this kind of behavior, news organizations when they see it, need to ask themselves whether this doesn't amount to a form of editorial greenwashing itself. To produce climate journalism, so you can say you have it, and you can point to the URL, you can say it's all there, but to never quite throw the full weight, the authority, and the reputation of your news organization's brand behind it when you promote it. Visuals. A very common operational challenge and obstacle for news organizations is how to find good photos or video visuals to illustrate climate stories. Especially on, on websites and on social media, the picture of a story can have a greater effect on the click-through rate than the actual headline of the story. And if you go to the landing pages, the section pages of climate desks at the major news organizations, you tend to see the ever same pictures, right? Ice caps, some polar bears still, not so much anymore, wildfires, uh, windmills, or landscapes filled with the ever same solar panels. Not very interesting and often also not very informative. And sometimes this limited choice of picture material is not only harmful to audience engagement, but can be downright misleading. You will have seen stories about potentially uh, deadly inner city heat waves that were illustrated with people eating ice cream in parks, uh, children or little dogs playing in water fountains, as if it was just another summer in the city and isn't it all nice type of story, and not an event that frequently costs many, many people their lives, especially older people who are alone and, and uh, can't afford air conditioning. The Oxford-based uh, initiative climatevisuals.org is trying to address this challenge, but we're also hoping uh, to have conversations with the, the picture agencies that are really relevant here, such as Getty Images, and to have these conversations with them uh, within the context of the Oxford Climate Journalism Network. This operational issue really surprised me. 
uh, and, and it was the Reuters Institute's Mera Selva that then helped me understand this better, which is that a few journalists told me they found it really difficult to get access to relevant scientists for their stories on climate change. Now, firstly, of course, there's a difference for you as a scientist if you receive a phone call or an email or a text from a national news organization or from a regional local outlet you have never heard of. But secondly, and more importantly, scientists have also told us about their experience of journalists so often hoping for the big breakthrough story, uh, scientific breakthrough stories, while most of science really happens in increments and not in breakthroughs. And this means that many scientists, especially climate scientists, can be wary of being misrepresented in the media. There was also one uh, science editor, Sven Stockram, I can quote him, former colleague of mine from Germany's Zeit Online, where I was the chief editor for many years. And I called Sven to ask him about the effects of covering COVID-19 uh, on his newsroom's overall collaboration with their science desk, which had increased tremendously during these last two years. And when I then asked Sven for which other changes he would now hope as that newsroom science editor, he said, I quote, he said, I would hope for a greater appreciation of the fact that questioning science is a core part of science. It is a misunderstanding of science when journalists primarily demand definitive answers from scientists or also from us science journalists." End of quote. Obviously, this appreciation of scientific disagreements should not be confused with the dismissal of science itself. If you read some of the IPCC's reports summaries for policymakers, you will see how methodically these scientists are using a specific terminology to assign different ranges or percentages of certainty or uncertainty to different topics. I would also add that covering climate change successfully does not only require knowing how to work with scientists. Increasingly, I think it also requires a much greater number of scientists in newsrooms and that more journalists learn to use the tools and the methods of science journalists and of scientists in their own research and reporting. Which leads me to this one, the last of our operational issues tonight called attribution. This is about attributing or not attributing extreme weather events to climate change as one of several causes. A typical mistake you could see quite often this last year, during the heat wave, for instance, in, in, in southern Europe, uh, a typical mistake many news organizations are making in reporting about extreme weather events, extreme wildfires, extreme floods, extreme heat waves or droughts, is that they ask a binary question whether the extreme event was caused by climate change or not. And while this seems like a perfectly plausible question, it does ignore the fact that extreme weather events, by and large, always have multiple causes. Climate change, climate change can make extreme weather events more likely and more intense, which is bad enough, but it is hardly ever their sole cause. Two other common mistakes that, that cost news organizations reputation are to not consider climate change as a cause at all, in cases where that question really should have been raised, or to preemptively mention climate change as the main cause of an extreme weather event when there is no data available yet whatsoever. Thankfully, this science of extreme weather event attribution as a branch of climate science is developing very quickly now, thanks to scientists such as Dr. Freddy Otto at Imperial College now and others who have also set up the website worldweatherattribution.org, a really important resource for journalists. So as you can see here again in this overview, all these operational issues are questions of either training, workflow changes, staffing or budgets. The cultural issues or levers we're now looking at and that came up um, are far fewer but much trickier. With climate change being the systemic issue, it affects, as you know, every general, every, every general news organization's desk or team. It is not only a topic for science, politics and business, but equally for, for every other branch. Take real estate journalism, food journalism, lifestyle and health journalism, sports and technology journalism, and increasingly, slowly, 
but increasingly culture journalism. And what this requires then from newsrooms is a very high degree of collaboration. The good news is many news organizations have seen such an increase during covering COVID. When, for instance, a business editor uh, knows by now to better check, double check with the science desk before running a story about two competing vaccine manufacturers, for instance. But a, there is a cultural difference between COVID-19 and climate change, and that is that climate journalists have been around for decades and very often felt and often still feel marginalized in their newsrooms. And so I did speak to a couple of well-respected science, environment or climate journalists who told me in no uncertain terms that they really did not like the idea of their travel desk now writing about the impacts of climate change on tourism or about the, the sometimes very severe future impacts of climate change on not just alpine sports, but for instance also tennis, cricket and football. One colleague said to me, I quote, why would I want our lifestyle desk to cover climate change? Most likely, their stories would contain scientific errors, but probably be illustrated with celebrities and perform much better than mine. Of course, a newsroom needs both the climate experts as well as a, a greater climate literacy across all desks. And to manage this coexistence and to nurture a culture of collaboration really comes down to the quality of a chief editor and a, and a, a newsroom's managing editor. The mental health of your staff, uh, you would think is really an operational issue, not a cultural issue, as that really comes down to ensuring um, that your leaders are well trained, that they detect signals of, of uh, colleagues having mental health issues and that the HR team knows how to provide support and counseling when that is needed. Um, there is a cultural dimension, though, when it comes to climate change. And that is that, as an industry, the news industry, there's a lot of institutional knowledge on how to protect or also uh, then care for crises and war reporters that have witnessed horrible things and are traumatized. But not as much is known yet about the health effects it can have on journalists to work on climate change full-time and also to feel marginalized or not understood or under the suspicion of activism 24-7 by the rest of their news organization. And I did have the privilege of getting invited into uh, the meetings of various of these newly founded self-help type uh, and self-educating networks of climate journalists in different European countries. And in all of these meetings, in all countries, without exception, I was surprised by the degree to which these journalists expressed their need for a peer group that would also provide them with the emotional support their own news organizations were not giving them, even if this meant sharing knowledge with some of their direct competitors. This is a bit of a red flag, solutions journalism, and I will hopefully explain why, or be able to explain. The cultural issue around so-called so solutions journalism has to do with the question whether journalists have a responsibility to not demoralize or frighten their readers or viewers with their journalism, but also to present stories about plausible solutions to the climate crisis as a way of giving hope. Such solutions could be the positive effects of new laws and regulations, new technologies, or also personal changes in behavior. The driving forces uh, behind these discussions in journalism circles are the Constructive Journalism Institute in Denmark, with a background in public broadcasting, and the Solutions Journalism Network in New York. About 80% of the climate journalists that I asked about their views on solutions or constructive journalism principles and methods indicated that they thought that meant to somehow sugarcoat the harsh realities of climate change or to not tell it as it is, as one journalist put it. In short, to be unjournalistic. But when you then consider some of the known reasons for news avoidance, also well researched by the Reuters Institute, I find this a questionable position to take. In a small structured survey amongst news organizations, I asked the following questions. Quote, several editors told us that many of their stories about climate change struggle to reach larger audiences due to their often frightening or demoralizing content. Have you observed this challenge as well? 
Of the 58 journalists who replied to this question, more than two-thirds, 69 percent, yes, we have. One journalist explained to me then that it still should not be his job to, to worry about whether his story has many readers or not, but only whether his report was accurate or not. This is an interesting ethical dilemma, isn't it? I do agree with him, because in many of journalism's greatest investigative achievements, these stories were not great audience successes, but still, they were of great value for a country's democracy or integrity. What seems to make this question on climate change more loaded, though, is that we are running out of time. We are running out of time. If we still want to keep global warming under 2 degrees Celsius, at least, let alone 1.5, and the gargantuan efforts needed for us to limit global warming to 2 degrees, require a much greater public awareness and a more detailed understanding of climate change. And so I would think that this does require, whether it's solutions journalism or constructive journalism, but that it does require a kind of journalism that readers, viewers or listeners want to engage with and, crucially, want to return to frequently because context and understanding only settles in over time. Of course, this public education is not the sole responsibility and task of journalism. Journalism cannot do this alone. But journalism plays a crucial role here. From the Reuters Digital News Report 2020, we know that the most used sources for news on climate change are not specialized outlets, but it is television content, live and on demand, and the news sites of major news organizations. So whether the news media want this or not, they tend to be their country's primary destination for people who would like to learn more about climate change. This is a more fundamental question that has never been articulated to me in my interviews, but that manifests itself as a consequence of what has been said to me. Is journalism's focus on the present even compatible with the time horizon of the climate crisis? Journalism is not exclusively, but predominantly, a retrospective activity. Most of a news organization's competitive energy and resource goes into reporting what just happened, and then in a second step into analyzing, interpreting and opining on what just happened or what is just about to happen. Albert Camus described his, uh, journalists once as the historians of the moment. And the former owners of the Washington Post, the Graham family, used to say, Journalism, sorry, journalism is the let me just go back here so we don't get the wrong slides. They said journalism is the first draft of history. The word journalism itself, the French word journalisme, comes from the Latin uh, adjective journalis, which means that of the day. I can't really think of another uh, profession that is named after a time frame, a day. So with climate change, journalism is now forced to discuss negative climate impacts as well as the hopefully positive effects of mitigation measures and actions that reach decades into the future. Whether we can achieve net zero emission reductions by 2050 in the case of the United States and the EU by 2060 in the case of China, by 2070 in the case of India. So covering climate change vastly stretches journalism's familiar time axis and thus introduces a degree of uncertainty and speculation into journalism that really does go counter to what journalism is built on and prides itself on. You could argue then that journalism should just stay away from the business of discussing long-term scenarios and predictions into the future, also given journalism's overall rather poor track record with predictions. Again, one problem with that argument is that governments, especially the US and the EU, are already in the process of making decisions today, spending our taxes, our future liquidity today, with the aim of reaching decades into the future, these so-called green deals, which require being scrutinized by journalists. 
But if it is any consolation, the world's climate scientists are facing a similar dilemma. Most of them have not signed up to become futurologists. As they are being asked, though, by the world's governments to make the best possible predictions and recommendations in their IPCC reports, they have developed new methods and new terminologies to adjust to this very unpleasant degree of uncertainty. Journalism, for lack of other societal actors to step in in time, should try to do the same. So these were the main cultural issues and levers. And in completing this second chapter of my talk, let's look at the very few ethical issues for newsroom that managers need to be aware of when developing their climate journalism. Again, ethical issues are different from cultural issues as they can many times be put to rest through a clearly communicated decision by newsroom's leadership. In one of my workshops with a very large national news organization outside of the UK, where I showed them my findings for them to also challenge and scrutinize them further, one news desk editor told me this story later and only on the way to the elevator. She, he, I have to keep this anonymized, had just published a story on the climate damage caused by sport utility vehicles, SUVs. One day later, one of their bosses in the newsroom came over and suggested suggested that now, in the interest of the news organization's impartiality or political equidistance, they should now follow up with a story about how many jobs the SUV manufacturers are providing that country with. And this incident illustrates what is considered false balance. Of course, the question of how to create new jobs of employees of potentially disappearing industries is a hugely important topic. It just is not the obvious twin or balancer or, or opposite to a discussion about the climate impact of SUVs. Nor is there a need to be apologetic for reporting on scientifically proven, highly peer-reviewed science. A more poignant example of false balance you may have seen during the reporting on COVID is that phenomenon of TV talk shows where an epidemiologist has to battle it out with outright COVID deniers. And again, the causes of COVID denial do require and do deserve journalistic attention and empathy. But that is not the same as giving a COVID denier equal status to an epidemiologist. A correctly framed and more informative balance, for instance, would have been, for example, to have two epidemiologists argue over their very conflicting approaches for how to fight a pandemic, as there is a wide range of scientific opinions and strategies but within the realms of science. This issue of false balance is also not just a theoretical problem, but it does do measurable damage in journalism when it comes to climate change. In 2019, a large-scale, truly large-scale academic analysis of roughly 100,000 English language, digital and print news media articles on climate change has shown how journalists often understate, misrepresent, just how much scientific agreement there is on the human-made causes of climate change. And newsroom managers do need to catch that. The fear of being accused of activism is a theme that has been mentioned to me, especially by younger climate reporters, one time also by a very senior manager of a national public broadcaster outside of the UK. And what struck me here was how this challenge of delineating between journalism and activism was a recurring theme in my conversations with journalists where I had guaranteed them confidentiality. Later on, though, in a written survey to which about 70 international journalists replied, many of them in very senior leadership positions, some of them chief editors, this challenge of not wanting to be accused, be accused of activism was only rate, rated as a minor issue by them. There are many anecdotal evidences, though, for uh, news organizations being attacked or meteorologists being attacked as activists simply for mentioning climate change as one of several causes of current extreme weather events. So I would say, given the foreseeable vehement conflicts over climate policy in many countries that are just beginning, newsroom managers would do their staff and their journalism a favor if they now reviewed or updated their editorial codes of conduct to make sure there is at least a shared understanding in their newsroom, a shared language on what they think typical indicators 
of possible editorial activism are, so editors can catch them, and more importantly, of what clearly is not activism in covering the accelerating climate crisis. So, we have now covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, how these operational, cultural, and ethical issues can shape a news organization's ways of covering or not covering climate change, uh, and also how you can use many of these issues in changing the, your newsroom. But imagine now there was this enlightened news organization that has successfully addressed all of these issues. One question would still remain. How do they decide what is newsworthy and how does climate journalism actually make it into the news? This discussion over news value criteria is a constant in, in journalism research, but it does remain surprisingly foggy inside every news organization I have ever worked with. If you do get the chance, uh, ask a news editor about the abstract criteria by which she or he has chosen the current set of stories for today's news update. And many times, you will only hear them paraphrase your own question right back to you when they reply by saying that their main criterion was relevance. <laughs> but typically these are very smart people and if you have time and if they have time to sit down with you and to really reflect on what influences their choices, you will typically hear at least a few of these uh, criteria mentioned here. The recency of a topic, after all it's news, the geographic vicinity to the audience, uh, the non-ambiguity or simplicity of a topic, that it doesn't require footnotes and, and explainers. Um, is there a personalization angle to tell the story? Is there an event angle to tell the story? Which is very much how fairy tales are also structured, how we learn to learn as children. Uh, what is today's news context? What else is going on? What are our competitors reporting? Is it an exclusive story? Or is it in the public interest? Now, having been a news editor myself for many years, uh, you are typically looking at a vast number of potential stories and topics to choose from every hour. And so on most days, these criteria are not meant to help you find relevant stories, but to filter out stories and to pick the very few that then still make it into your list. So imagine then being a climate journalist, having just completed a story and hoping your news desk will give it as much visibility as possible. Recency. Climate change has been around, and climate change will be around next week and next year. So if, there's, if there are a lot of other stories, why run it today? Geographic vicinity, especially in Northern Europe or in the UK, climate change typically was worse somewhere else and manifests itself more somewhere else. Non-ambiguity, by all means, climate change is highly complex and not uh, non-ambiguous. -ambi Personalization. I'd say compared to many other big issues, there's still a surprisingly small number of celebrities or athletes who speak up about climate change or also of well-known uh, climate experts. Event angles. Climate change is mostly a process, not an event. It is not a volcano eruption, it is not an earthquake. It is a far bigger disaster, but slower moving. And the news media preference, the news media's preference for event angles can lead to really odd phenomena, such as that the news of the breaking off of a big sheet of ice in the uh, Antarctic makes it into the news, but the news of a scientific study about the fact that we may already have reached or are reaching a tipping point of the melting of the Western Antarctic, which would be catastrophic in its consequences, barely makes it into the news, because it's not an event and it doesn't have more visuals than a screenshot of a PDF. Exclusivity, yes, there are scoops possible in climate journalism. I expect many more, uh, also on emissions uh, uh, fraud, but mostly uh, stories about climate finance policy technology. It's difficult to get exclusives there. And then the day's context, if there are other seemingly more pressing issues, such as COVID, uh, it will be hard to get climate change into the news. The competition. This is an element of conformity. If enough competitors run a story, news desks sometimes begin wondering whether they called it right by not running it. Or in reverse, if no other news organization runs a, sp a specific story prominently, but only you do, and it isn't an exclusive scoop either, 
It requires a confident news editor to stand behind this choice long enough for your story to gain visibility. This is where organizations such as Covering Climate Now can really help move the needle as they try to build alliances of news organizations to jointly cover with different angles, different views, the same event to gain traction. I may have spent too many years in newsrooms to think that these news value criteria could or should be changed, but I think making them more conscious across newsrooms would already be a big step. And this is happening at Agence France Presse, one of the world's largest news agencies, uh, where their global chief editor, Sophie Huette, is in the process of making sure that all their journalists and bureaus around the world start adding the climate angle or the climate dimension to a story just as they would have always added the financial dimension or the financial angle to a story in the past. And in consequence, the effect this has on news production also affects a shift in uh, news value criteria. Which leaves us with a very short chapter three tonight. Let's say you are a newsroom leader who is aware of these issues and has dealt with them. What do you do next? Where do you start? I have mentioned this tendency earlier of many chief editors to frame most every problem as a question of what type of content uh, should they produce or what type of uh, content producing team of journalists should they set up. And so I saw quite a lot of news organizations in these last years who responded to that criticism of not covering climate change sufficiently by then producing a special climate issue. Uh, a sustainability supplement, a climate week, a climate podcast, or by launching a small climate desk. And all of this is good, very good. These initiatives at least start conversations and help you detect talent you may not have been aware of. But in some ways, these kinds of ring-fenced initiatives can also make you lose time, as they are eerily similar to how legacy news organizations have first responded to the rise of the internet as that last and smaller systemic challenge. They responded with special issues about the internet, and it was reported on as if it was a place somewhere else, with topical weeks, and then with the launch of separate digital teams, of which they often had a very ambivalent view, sometimes to the point of publicly wondering whether these colleagues were even journalists or not just content managers. And there is an analogy to how sometimes climate reporters are under this public suspicion even of activism. From this perspective, I would advise interested newsroom leaders to not just start with new content and format development right away, but first with establishing basic climate literacy for the largest possible number of staff. And, if at all possible, frame climate literacy in the newsroom not as a chore, or as a duty, or as catching up. Frame it as a career opportunity, because it is. One last personal remark. I very much believe we, humanity, can make this uh, transition. But I think it will be a very bumpy ride and not as orderly as we hope for. We need journalism to help us navigate this journey. And we need journalism to help us hold our societies together. Over the course of this last year, I have met many wonderful, optimistic, competent climate journalists, young and old. And so I am now more optimistic than I have been a year ago. And I want to thank these journalists and I thank you all online as well for your attention tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Russ, um, Wolfgang, okay. for, um, for that kind of magisterial overview that's both personal and global and asks us to look as journalists, as many of the people in the room are as journalists, but also as news consumers, and which we all are in one way or another, and to look at how we read the news and make decisions about what we read and how we process it and how we share it.
how we share it amongst friends and our communities and what we do with the news. Um, I also talk in the Journalist Fellowship Programme about the need to advocate for, our, advocate for ourselves as journalists to make the public case about what we do, why it's important. I think journalists forget to do that at times. Um, we kind of get, get used to telling other people's stories and don't want to become the story, and we shouldn't become the story, but we do need to kind of explain why we exist in this climate. And, the, you know, the issue of climate science is one area where, mm. again, we need to make the case over and over. I will just throw the um, I throw it open to questions in the room. We have, again, some incredibly senior editors with us today and journalists and journalist fellows as well, who are often in that category as well. Um, there's a mic, so please um, wait for the mic, put your hand up and wait for the mic to reach you, and then if you introduced yourself briefly as well. Let's start with you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Shah Jamil. I'm a research fellow at Green. Um, over the last three years, COVID has really uh, been the main story, except for the period when COP26 happened. What I didn't see is enough being reported about the effects of climate change on disease itself. That could have been an opportunity, and that's an opportunity lost. Thank you. It's a very good question. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, th 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 there were a few pieces on that connection, and also the loss of habitat, uh, which again also uh, has to do with climate change, but not many pieces. Overall, though, I do think that uh, covering COVID has taught news organizations very important lessons. Um, how important it is to early on um, not necessarily in a coordinated way, it just happened to settle, for instance, on a few key metrics that were embedded in every story and that could be referred to in the news so that after a few months you could have conversations with your neighbor about vaccination rates and hospitalization rates and things like that. Um, that was really very well done. So, the, but again, the difference to climate change is what helped with this one is we knew what to do. You know, wash hands, keep a distance, eventually get vaccinated. With climate change, it's again so much more complex. Thank you. And I'm a comm strategist, climate comm strategist. Um, there's so much in there that it's hard to pick on one particular topic. But I wondered if you, if you could talk more about climate trauma hmm. as opposed to climate crisis or climate emergency, because it feels a little as if we're still focused on the facts, and yet we have people in the room, illuminati of uh, communicating the facts to the public, and it feels sometimes that facts aren't enough. Obviously, we need to start with the science, and we need to have a baseline of that. But I suppose I'd like to ask, in a sense, it's treating the public as though they're computers, and in fact, we are more like horses, if you like, and so, how, uh, Dr. Carmody Gray is good on this, actually. I don't know if you've ever heard her, mm. but she talks about uh, the loving ourselves enough to want to save ourselves. And it's something to do with uh, our view of ourselves, like Rutger Bregman talks about, and, and values speaking to people's values, that that is what motivates people, not facts. George Marshall, who wrote the book uh, here in Oxford, wrote the book, uh, Don't Even Think About It, How Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. He spoke with a lot a couple of years ago, neuroscientists, and came back with that surprise of saying only a small minority of people respond to facts and figures. Most of us respond to emotive narratives and, and, and stories. And I saw that on other issues, whether it was Brexit or other political issues, where the, the, the impulse of, of journalists as well as of political campaigners is to fight each other with facts. Uh, and facts are important, believe me, but it's not the whole story, which is why some of these climate documentaries that just bombard you with facts and figures and numbers uh, can rather be numbing. On the other hand, there is no such thing as the audience and it, that one of the strengths of digital journalism would be to make different offers to different audiences. We just, we're not doing that yet enough. Thank you. That lady. Hi, uh, my name is Joy. Um, I'm a journalist, but I'm currently doing my master's in environmental change and management here. 
I guess, working on my own climate literacy. But I guess the question I have for you is, you know, throughout your research, um, have you come across any surprising findings uh, between the different types of challenges that journalists or newsrooms might face depending on the geographic uh, region that they're from, yeah. like perhaps Global North versus Global yeah. South, yeah, yeah, yeah. or in countries that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Yes, yeah. this is a topic that both Mayor and I are very passionate about, and that also has, has guided us, uh, I mean, Mera says it daily, on, on, on the composition of our network, that it really represents a, a very different range of countries and cultures. So uh, I remember one story that really left a deep impression on me where an African journalist said, I don't even have an issue with a lack of climate literacy with my audience. Many of my listeners, this was a radio station, have never heard the word. And as you know, I think currently four of the five hardest hit countries by climate change are in Africa. And he said, I have farmers who, who have failed harvests, but many of them think it's God's punishment. So where do I start? So that was an aha moment for me. Another one is that um, uh, just getting decent weather data or emissions data in many countries is an issue. And just to add to that, that's the key part of what we're trying to do with the Oxford Climate Journalism Network. We have journalists from all around the world, including places where there is no data available on what's happening right outside their window, and we're trying to find ways to address that there as well. Morten. Hi, I'm Morten. I'm a journalism fellow at Reuters Institute. Um, I'm intrigued by this concept, editorial greenwashing. You know, hosting content but not throwing your full weight in. Mm -hmm. What does throwing your full weight in specifically mean? Does it mean pushing stories that readers won't read anyway? Does it mean keeping a story high on my website that I can see audience is not engaging in? Not every story that opens a primetime news show is, is one that will be an audience success. Many times, as an editor, as you know, you have stories that just have to be there because you think they are in the public interest. And with climate change and this additional fear in many news organizations that you somehow wade into politics, if you even mention it in the news, you then have a, that, that double problem, A, that you know it will not perform well, but it needs to be there, but B, you may even get attacked for it. So you're doubly disincentivized. And of course, that is a slightly polemic formulation to say editorial greenwashing, but we're seeing it. You, you wonder often with news organizations when you track them more methodically and take a story and say, all oh, right, you can track when was it posted on the main social media accounts that often can drive significant amounts of traffic. And then you see, oh, interesting, it was a Saturday afternoon or something, off time. Um, you can see how often was it posted, things like that. You can use screen tracking tools to see, did it ever show up on the homepage, these kinds of things. Um, and that's not only true for the climate journalism of organizations that publish hundreds of stories a day, some of them. Uh, but if climate change magically never makes it into the upper news list, there is a question to be asked. Thank you. I think I've lost track of my pretty high. Hello. My name is David. I'm a student at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College. And I'm 24, so I probably belong to the target group, <laughs> worried yeah. youth. Uh, my focus is visual climate communication. So I'm very interested in your insight. Where would you say, I took a few notes, where would you say research is currently taking place on visual climate communication, not only in journalism, but in the context of new media new technologies and new narrative forms. So for example, you mentioned climate visuals, which are working on visual climate communication, mm -hmm. the Yale program and Monash University, which are working on climate communication, and for example, New York Times research, BBC research, which are working on new technologies, but I haven't heard of a research institute which combines those fields. I don't know. I don't know if there's a specialized institute on climate visuals. But I do know that as one of the world's largest news agencies uh, that also distributes photos, um, that, that uh, IFP is working on that. And uh, Getty also is working on that question of how to, how to do a better job. Okay. But not in terms of research institutes. No, and there's kind of anecdotal stories about people trying to move the dial on what visuals mm -hmm. they use, but um, not, not yeah. systematic research. Thank you. Uh, Rasmus, if I pass the mic Rasmus. forward. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, thanks very much, Wolfgang. I also really appreciate not just your lecture, but also where you ended with a sense of cautious optimism. Um, and I think you're right to detect a desire for change as well. Um, I wonder whether you think uh, that journalism might have a role in a sort of uh, holding uh, its own profession and own industry to account and, and reckoning with what I think is a fact that uh, in addition to um, parts of the industry that may not have covered the story with the attention uh, and approach that one might hope for, there are also parts of the industry and parts of the profession who have contributed to China, climate change denial. Um, and uh, I wonder whether you think that a sort of a public reckoning with that and an attempt to hold the profession and industry itself to account should be part of how journalism moves forward or whether it's better to let that lie and focus on the bigger issue of climate change itself and how we respond to it rather than whether parts of the media and parts of the journalistic profession sometimes may have contributed uh, to, the, uh, to the, the, the challenge that we face. So if I understand your question right, the dilemma is if journalists make an issue of journalism's own failures that that could damage the trust and credibility journalism needs so desperately in conveying, for instance, climate literacy. Well, I mean, there's only so much time uh, in the world, yeah. so much news hold. Um, do we want to make it about, also about journalism or, or stick to the big story? I think we need that scrutiny. I think if, if we say our profession is built on holding power to account, that needs to include ourselves. Absolutely. And of course, we all have witnessed this, this dramatic decline in media journalism uh, over these last years. So the question is always, who can do this? And I see you rightly pointing out every once in a while that uh, as publisher and especially publisher associations like to point out the role of social media platforms in distributing misinformation and disinformation, it often comes from news organizations as well. And that does need to be reckoned with. Thank you. Alan. Um, one wonderful lecture, Wolfgang. Um, Thank you. A, a couple of linked questions. Um, one is about the role, given that money is so in such short supply in news organizations, the role of foundations in supporting journalism. What are the upsides and downsides of that? And secondly, given that so much the news is supported by advertising, what do you think, and looking at what's happened in Spotify recently, mm -hmm. of people withdrawing <coughs> advertising from, from news, organizations, news organizations that uh, are polluting the news uh, information structures? So I have not heard a single story, also in all these off-the-record conversations of advertisers having withdrawn support or threatened to withdraw support. Um, what I have heard and what um, Adweek, the industry publication of the advertising industry in the US, has written about is that in fact, after years of, of, of the corporate side of news organizations saying there's no money to be made with these negative climate news, uh, they're now reporting at Bloomberg went on the record, BBC Global um, and the Financial Times that they see enormous growth numbers in revenue uh, from advertisers who want to have editorial environments for them to place advertising, uh, not all of them, but a lot of that also greenwashing about their own efforts. So there are commercial opportunities, uh, which the Financial Times especially and Bloomberg Green are tapping into. Um, to your other question about, if that answers the question about advertising. Whether you think advertisers should withdraw their advertising? Oh, the other way around, to, to exert pressure. Yes. Well, the, 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 the conflict, of course, would be that they are undermining the public sphere and are intervening, and that taps into a much greater discussion about what is the role of corporations and what is the role of purpose. Is it just a thing on the side or is it the core of an organization? I am part of that camp, so to say, that says uh, CEOs absolutely need to become societal actors again, because we are running out of time. And that can include measures such as that as well. Um, to your other question about foundation support, uh, it depends on the foundation. It depends on the foundation. And in, in the UK, at least, with, with institutions such as Charity House, where you can at least get an idea of where a foundation's money is coming from, uh, 
um, it, it just deserves scrutiny of who is behind that foundation that pays, and then also how do you disclose it? As we did at The Guardian, where I thought we were extremely transparent who sponsored something and what that meant and what it did not mean. Thank you. Timothy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a kind of fascinating lecture. I've been thinking, um, if I were a journalist covering this lecture, what the headline would be and what the lead would be. Um, I don't know what your answer to that is, but it seems to me it might be something around what I think you demonstrated, which is just how difficult it is to make climate change newsworthy by your own criteria. So um, imagine I'm a journalist from, say, the Bild Zeitung, and give me the three or four sentence summary of the message of your lecture, but in English, not German. No. At this point, I have to thank my wife, Elisa, here, because she asked me that question earlier in the restaurant. <laughs> uh, and I think the headline is, first, do not think of climate change as a topic that you can process with your usual trusted and proven methods. Climate change is so big, it explodes some of your proven methods and newsroom workflows and departmental structures. Second, um, this is an enormous opportunity for journalism. If you ever wondered why you're in this profession, here's your answer. We are so desperately needed because the time pressure adds a dimension that no other topic in the past had. We, if we want to keep emissions, as you know, under uh, 1.5, we need to half our emissions uh, by 2030. Such a shift, a complete re-engineering of everything we do with everything, how we heat, how we eat, what we wear, how we build, everything, how we transport, has never been done before. So that, of course, is an opportunity for journalism, but a systemic challenge. Now, Bill would already have walked out the room and said, thank you, but uh, <laughs> to come back to your question, uh, I'm better with Die Zeit than with Bill. Uh, I, would, I would say, this will change everything you do because it changes everyone else's profession. This is a huge opportunity, train up, skill up, and it will really demand courage from you. Thank you. I'm going to cluster a few questions because there's so many in the room, but Haya, if you ask a question and then pass it to Hannah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Haya and I'm a... Here I am. Hi, Haya. <laughs> uh, my name is Haya and I'm a journalist fellow at the Reuters Institute. And I'm also interested in climate change. Uh, my friends from Europe and Arab countries, we created a, a global uh, initiative called Peace on Climate to promote the linkage between climate change and conflict um, uh, around certain uh, areas in the world, regions in the world, and mm -hmm. specifically in the Sahel region, where, Which as region? you mentioned, Sahel region. The Sahel. Yeah. Um, where, for example, a lot of people, a lot of farmers, uh, because of the drought, have yep. lost their job. And so they were, they were a very easy target for terrorist groups where they were armed and joined these groups. And also, like in between other countries, there are conflict over uh, natural resources and water. So this linkage is very important. And we're trying to promote that linkage um, uh, around the world and specifically to decision makers. Do you recognize this uh, linkage and how can we better report on this specific issue? It's a really good point and thank you for raising it. Could, could you just pass the mic to Hannah so we'll ask the two questions together? Thank you. But yes, because I reported on the Darfur crisis, which Maybe. was a climate change conflict as well. Maybe. Hannah. Because Mira knows a lot about these topics as well. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, yes. my name is Hannah. I'm also a fellow at the Reuters Institute. Hi, Hannah. I w had a question about um, activism. Mm -hmm. well, it's a two-part question. One, in your experience, in your talks, have you been? Do you see a shift towards sort of more uh, acceptance of activism on this topic? Mm -hmm. And the other part, to what extent is do you think climate change, the the big story of climate change, is affected by the fact that some activists now are quite powerful in a way that they didn't used to be, so they can sort of shift global opinion in maybe a way that they didn't before. I'm thinking of what Greta is more, Thunberg. What is more powerful? 
Sorry? What, what is it that is becoming more powerful? Activists, like Activists. Mm -hmm. Greta Thunberg or, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. other that have more of a stage now. Yeah, I, I, I know I um, covered the topic of activism very briefly, that would be a, a, an entire talk. Um, but no, I did not see a, a growing endorsement of activism, quite the opposite, which I think is good. I think this topic doesn't require journalistic activism. We need activists, but not in the newsroom. There are other opinions and there are also newsrooms. There's, there's a proud tradition of campaigning in newsrooms in the UK, all the way back to Sir Harold Evan at the Sunday Times, which was wonderful. But I think climate change doesn't need that extra push to gain importance. Uh, and I would really advise news organizations to not venture into activism on this issue because it's not necessary. Covering the science would be sufficient as a starting point. Um, but having said that, I also think that journalists should really be careful to not use activist as an almost pejorative curse word. Without activists, we would have no freedom of the press. We would have no right to vote. Most everything we enjoy as, as civil rights, we owe to activists. It's just not the same as journalism. And did you want to respond to Hayes? Yes, but I have to admit, I did not understand the question, what specifically these two issues are that you want to connect with your reporting. If, if you want to help me. Yeah. Um, the linkage between climate change and, cri uh, and conflict, okay. um, how can we report on that? And so it's the uh, idea of basically a kind of fight for natural resources that tips mm -hmm. over into violence mm -hmm. and the consequences and of desertification. And do you recognize this kind of conflict as well? Well, yes, there is quite a lot of literature in, in, in security policy circles, and NATO has, has a working group on it, on, on the, the, the conflict risk of climate change. NATO, in its codified language, calls it a risk multiplier, climate change. It, says it makes every conflict worse and leads to a whole new range of new conflicts. There is also a, um, just like there's the international energy agencies, there's the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, also an intergovernmental organization, and they have published a really interesting paper about the geopolitical problems that come with renewable energy, which is not all benign either, it's just a different set of conflicts. So there is literature, now the question, maybe we can follow up in, in, in person or online, is for which audience you want to prepare that. And it's a kind of vital question because it's which audience, what story, how long do you stay on the story because it's multifaceted and changes. There are loads of questions, but we are running out of time. So I am very, very sorry, but I will pass over um, in a moment. But just to say this is an ongoing conversation. Both Wolfgang and I and everyone at the Reuters Institute will continue engaging in this and would really love to continue hearing from you all as well on this. So please do kind of stay engaged. And in the meantime, this is being hosted at um, Green Tufton College, and one of the best things about it is its student body and the diversity and range of mm. the students here. And so I'd like to hand over to our student rapporteur, Jeremy, um, to finish up. And thank you all, and thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Mira. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was quite extraordinary, was it not? Um, I want to uh, finish off this evening to express um, all of our thanks, I think, to um, a few of the many people who have made this lecture possible, because there's an awful lot of infrastructure in this kind of thing. But specifically, I'd like to mention uh, Mira Selva and uh, Rasmus Nielsen, who uh, coordinate this series of lectures, and uh, they're doing an extraordinary job, and I think we're all very grateful for that. I would like to thank uh, the Vice Principal Rebecca Surender for her uh, opening remarks and her welcome. And most specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Wolfgang Blau for this quite remarkable and most memorable presentation this evening, which I think has changed a lot of things. So thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you.